I'm going to talk uh, almost exclusively about large-scale solar today, although that's not the largest part of the UK market yet or the world market yet. Um, it's a very important part in, in both contexts, and this is why the utility-scale PV market is growing very, very rapidly at the moment globally, and these, these are worldwide figures, um, and is continuing to do so even as other parts of the PV market um, are leveling <laughs> off or, or declining. So, I mean, you can see there it's, it's enjoyed tremendous growth in the last three years. In the first five months of this year, we've already um, globally installed 3.5 gigawatts of, of utility scale worldwide. Um, my best guess is that um, there's another at least five gigawatts to go this year based on projects already under development. So again, it will almost double again this year. <coughs> um, and in this context, I'm, I'm calling utility scale 10 megawatts and up, although later on I, I'll talk about 5 megawatts and up because in the context of the UK market, 10 megawatts is, is penal for, for various historical reasons. The kind of primary driver uh, in the UK renewables market generally is the European Renewable Energy Directive. We have to get 15% of our energy from renewables by 2020. Um, which doesn't sound a hell of a lot until you realize that we started at less than 5%. We are way over here, not quite the worst in, in Europe. We're, we're, our blushes are, are protected by Malta and Luxembourg. But the UK is historically has historically always been very, very low down the league table in terms of renewables. So getting from under 5 to 15% in less than a decade is really quite a demanding target. And... You know, as a nation, you know, we play cricket and that sort of thing. We, we believe in, in playing by the rules, and therefore, if we've got an obligation to get to 15%, we will probably try really quite hard to actually achieve it. We won't just let it slip by. So, you know, there's a strong underlying driver to renewables in the UK. And as it happens, that, that has, has particularly driven large-scale solar in, in, you know, in recent months in particular. Um, and this table, which is now based, so to differentiate from what I showed before, this is now based on 5 megawatts and above. If I did the same table on, on 10 megawatts and above, the UK would be lower. The reason 5 megawatts is appropriate for the UK is because the upper limit to the feed-in tariffs that Ray talked about earlier on is, was 5 megawatts, or is 5 megawatts. And therefore, all of the early projects that were built under the feed-in tariffs were no more than 5 megawatts. And most of the projects being built now, even though they're no longer being installed under the FITS, they're being installed under the renewables obligation, they were actually de designed and consented to be FITS pro projects, and therefore a lot of them were designed on 5 megawatt plots. So a lot of the UK's capacity is at 5 megawatts, and that's why uh, drawing the line there is, is more appropriate when looking at the UK market. And, and as you can see, from having not been on this table a year ago, we're, we're now ninth. And if you look at what's gone on, you know, what's happened just in the first few months of this year, the UK is actually number four in terms of the installed new capacity of utility scale projects um, behind only the US, China, and India. Um, and ahead, ahead, therefore, for example, of, of the traditional powers, Germany. And what you're seeing, you know, globally in terms of, of the, you know, the uh, utility scale markets, um, although Germany is, is still hanging in at number one, you will have seen the announcement from UV yesterday, it's not going to be number one at the end of this year, it'll be down at number three, um, having been leapfrogged by, by the US and China. China will probably actually leapfrog first, but the US will leapfrog bigger, and by the end of this year, the US is, is likely to be the largest utility scale market in the world. This is where they all are, um, both projects that are built, which are colored in a sort of bluey color, and projects that aren't yet built, projects under development in a sort of gray color. Um, as said earlier on, there was a sort of heavy weighting down to the southwest. That is, is shifting somewhat for, for a, a number of reasons. One is, just because it's the reddest place on the map, as said earlier, isn't necessarily the only place you can consider putting up a project. There's, you, you can put up projects in other parts of the country and get 
sunlight levels that are only a few percent lower and economics that are much better. Another fundamental driver is, is where you can get a grid connection and, and grid connections were proving hard already for the wind industry for, for onshore schemes. Um, they're now squeezing out a lot of PV schemes, in, particularly down in the southwest. Um, Jonathan was saying earlier, even parts of East Anglia are now, now getting harder. So the more of these projects get built, the more you're going to have to consider where you can get a grid connection at, at a price that you can afford. In terms of, of you know, the, the sort of world picture, as I say, we're, we're, we're still not very high in the list. In terms of the largest schemes that are out there, the, and, and these photographs are to scale, if you like. The biggest utility project currently being built is 550 megawatts. Um, that's the Topaz project in California by um, First Solar, uh, owned by a subsidiary of, of uh, Warren Buffett's empire. Um, and they connected the first 50 megawatts of that earlier this year. Largest one in China, Golmud, 200 megawatts. Um, largest in Germany, Neuheidenberg. Someone remind me what this, 100, 110, 145, 120? 145. 145, thank you, 145 megawatts. Largest one in the UK so far, 33 megawatts in Wimswold, which is um, uh, in, in Leicester in the East Midlands, uh, installed by Lark Energy. So, you know, quite a lot of, of underlying good things, some strong drivers, uh, things actually happening in the UK. Policy, lots and lots of good policy in the UK, at least at the, at the rhetoric level. We talk a lot about climate change. If, you know, if, if you've got medals for talking about climate change, <laughs> UK would be top of the, top of the league table. Um, we're very good at producing policy documents, as you can see, we've done all of these in the last um, five or six years. But, you know, we do start to overcomplicate things when it, when it comes to actually turning it into, into policy mechanisms. And I mean, if you, if you just look at the, the sort of landscape of policy in the UK mm -hmm. uh, across the energy sector and, and different, you know, areas of, of the energy sector, we've got incentives for emissions reductions like you know emissions trading scheme energy efficiency commitment crc energy efficiency scheme then we've got specific incentives for renewables the two ap applicable to electricity the renewables obligation the feed-in tariffs but then there's one for renewable transport fuels there's one for renewable heat there's green deal which is sort of energy efficiency plus so covers a bit of renewables and then because we think that's all still not complicated enough, we're about to change the entire electricity market, the way that operates, with a thing called electricity market reform, which is going to replace, in principle, both the renewables obligation and the feed-in tariffs with a new mechanism, which they'll probably call feed-in tariffs, because feed-in tariffs has, has been seen to be quite successful. So the government will hang on to the word, but actually it won't be tariffs at all. It will be a rather complicated contract for different scheme, more similar to the renewables obligation. But all, you know, it, this is all quite complex, and um, it does mean that before you can even start a project, you, you have to spend a huge amount of time working out how you're going to configure it for the scheme you're, you're, you're trying to fit into, and how you're going to optimise the, the returns under that scheme. So, in sort of summary, the UK a lot of good things about it, strong statutory driver. Um, the financial support being given under the, both the feed-in tariffs and the RO, um, as Ray said earlier on, is probably just about good enough for good schemes in many parts of the country. Um, but if you get um, difficulties like expensive grid connections or, you know, some things can, can tip schemes over and make them un uneconomic under, under the present uh, tariff regimes, they're not overly generous is what I'm saying. Plenty of financial options as well, which I'll come back to later. You know, on the downside, it is quite complex. The, the regulatory regime is quite complex. Grid connection is becoming uh, more of an issue in more parts of the country. The planning system has up until now really been quite kind to uh, solar projects. Very few have, have actually been finally turned down. Some have been rejected and, and then accepted on appeal. But it will, you know, expect it to get harder because, um, 
you know, as you see more and more schemes up there, there will be a, a, a sort of inevitable backlash from the, 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 the sort of NIMBYs who have so blighted the wind industry. And, you know, as an industry, we can do a lot, I think, to, to sort of mitigate that and, and to try and not get into the area where that will become a problem. Okay, a bit about the sort of main players in the UK market. And, and this is, if you like, a sort of map of what type of organization is doing which. And this, again, is, is based on data from Wikisolar. Wikisolar for each project, and it, I showed you that it maps projects, and it maps these projects worldwide as well. And for each project, um, we note down, you know, who owns it, the, the uh, ultimate owner or the IPP, the project developer, in other words, the person kind of responsible for getting the project started, usually the organization that gets a project consented. Uh, people who built it, the EPC contractor, the site owner, the landowner, power off taker, and the financiers. And, and we also keep a record, although it's nothing to do with what's going on here, but also of the module supplier or suppliers and the inverter suppliers. Um, and what this has done is just sort of color code what type of, of organization is active in, in what sort of activity, um, where sort of darkest green is, is the most going on and lightest green is something going on and light red is things starting to go on and white means nothing's going on, basically. Um, and that is changing as well and, and perhaps we'll talk about that as, as, as we look at the main sort of participants. Based on the projects that are actually installed at five megawatts and above, installed and connected, um, this should be a pretty accurate list of, of the top owners, the, the independent power producers are the people who, um, you know, actually, if you like, have title to the plant. The biggest by a long way is, is Light Source, who are specialist IPP, who did the smart thing of, of getting into bed right at the start with a finance provider, in their case, Octopus, and therefore were able to, to get projects up and running fast. And because our government was changing the, the schemes so regularly and so rapidly and so stringently in some cases, the ability to get a project built fast, to not have a lot of steps between a consent and a built project, really meant that they, they, you know, they could mobilize quicker and, and that was a real source of success to them. In terms of the project developers, as I say, the people who, who sort of conceive the project um, and sometimes oversee its construction, sometimes sell it on before that happens. Um, this is our list of, of who we think the top ones are. As you can see, interesting mix of, of companies. In this case, all of the top ones, although some lower down the list are from other countries, but all of the top ones are either British or German. And of course, the, the German developers have a huge experience base in which, from which to draw. Next one, the EBC contractors, people who are building the projects. Um, these are the ones who, who seem to have built the you know, most projects. Solar Century, UK company at the top of that. But here again, see German companies in the list, Portuguese companies, Indian companies, <coughs> Dutch companies. You know, the countries which have invested to, to build a a business in this sector are now getting the benefit of that by being able to move into emerging markets like the UK and use their existing expertise. Far thinner range of, of power off takers. The UK energy market or electricity market, as you may know, is, is um, very highly, um, ha has been thoroughly privatized. We've got a big, our big six uh, companies and and they all certainly take power from renewable uh, from renewable energy projects and from solar parks. Outside of them, there are three, um, if you like, specialist energy suppliers, smaller energy suppliers, um, Smartest, Good, and Ecotricity, who also uh, take power from selected solar parks. And then below that on the list, you'll see large energy users who actually consider it's, it's worthwhile. Um, either sponsoring a, a solar park like Bentley on their own roof or tying up with a solar park that's, that's uh, been installed locally and taking the power from it like Amy Sesper are doing from the Chittering Solar Farm. Um, 
I concluded it was almost impossible to talk about all of the different financial models that might be set up and, and that are currently being used in the UK to sort of uh, support this, this part of the market because, you know, let's face it, the UK's got a whole lot more financiers than we've got PV practitioners. And for every PV panel we've got a finance, you can think of 15 different ways of putting a financial package around that and making money out of it. So there are lots of different models being employed out there, you know, all the way from specialist solar funds that, that have raised money specifically for the sector, and you saw some of the owners on the slide I showed back of it, are basically specialist funders who, who've gone out and raised money to invest in these schemes. There are more general funds who invest in different technologies, decided this is technology they want and, and have either a separate fund or invest part of their main fund in the solar sector. Specialist IPPs, you know, bringing their own equity and with custom uh, debt providers, I suppose like LightSource in a way, who have Octopus behind them, as I said. Um, there are a few community schemes out there, very, very few. Um, I'm fortunate to be the, the non-executive chairman of, of the largest of those, which is West Mill Solar Cooperative, a five megawatt um, solar installation near Swindon. Um, and there, that was, that was financed partly with equity. We raised um, about six million pounds sterling from 1,600 um, you know, members, 1,600 members of the community, 70% of them living within 40 kilometers of the installation. And then we raised 12 million in uh, debt from uh, the pension fund of a local authority, not actually the local authority where the project's located, but one up in the north. So uh, Lancashire County Council Pension Fund uh, put up the debt for that, and probably the first um, local authority pension fund in the UK to invest in, in a solar scheme, and certainly the first one to invest in a community scheme like this. But, you know, it shows that if you've got a good project, you can get new financial players into the market as well. And lots of people now um, sniffing around the renewables market. Quite a large body of investors in the UK, anyway, with experience in wind, you know, that has been going five to ten years longer than solar. So a lot of those are, are, are familiar with investing in renewable energy infrastructure projects of this type. Um, not all of them yet sufficiently comfortable with solar or know sufficient about solar to do that, but you will progressively see them moving in as well. And, you know, the other complication is you and they really need to structure the projects, take advantage of whatever sort of financial incentives are out there and tax breaks that are out there, because you'll not be surprised to hear that the tax regime is at least as complicated as the incentive regime for um, renewable energy. So, you know, obviously the investors and the individuals working the companies will have the regular income tax regime. The businesses will be subject to corporation tax, national insurance, regular capital allowance schemes. On top of that, you know, within this sector, people who are building projects will have to work within the construction industry scheme. Some renewables not at the moment actually large-scale solar, but some renewables are eligible for enhanced capital allowances. There's always lobbying pressure to get solar included into that. So, you know, you need to keep track of whether that's going to come in as part of the ECA scheme. And then on top of that, you've, you've got various um, tax breaks for investing, of, of which the main ones really are for private investors, the Enterprise Investment Scheme, which basically means that a, a private investor who puts money, a certain amount of money, into a qualifying company um, can get 40% of that back really on day one um, as, as a tax incentive. And then there's a, a, a mini version of that, the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme. Um, there's a problem, and that is uh, last year the government took out from eligibility under the EIS, any project that was uh, earning income under FITS or ROCKS, um, unless it's a community-owned project. So, you know, lots of regulations within the regulation. Venture capital trusts are kind of the same sort of thing for business. It's a way in which um, you can set up a, a tax-efficient um, fund uh, in which businesses can invest. 
far fewer provi uh, finance providers currently in the um, UK market, but as I say, more will come, so watch this space. Um, but here are a few who've already, you know, already shown some appetite, already done stuff, um, and there are undoubtedly others actually we don't know about. People don't always publish who their financial backers were, so I'm sure there are lots of others there, you know, on top of those. So, a final word of warning, really, if, if you're considering installing, you know, or developing new large-scale projects in the UK, a lot of it, you know, the technology will be familiar to you. It won't be hard for you to, to design the scheme, to make it operate efficiently, and all that kind of stuff. But there are some local wrinkles in the UK that you're going to need to be aware of, and unless you're lucky enough to have... Um, lots of good people on, in, on your team with experience of that, you're probably going to need to spend some money on grid connection specialists, planning consultants, tax advisors, lawyers, accountants, and all of these kinds of things. And uh, I suppose and if you want general advice, then you can spend some money on me as well. <laughs>